for today it's just a reminder that today is communion sunday so if you are watching this recording later on please make sure that you have all your elements ready and then the guild is starting again on tuesday the 14th of september at 2 30 pm in the afternoon in the open door and next sunday will be our guild dedication service so all the guild members uh, are welcome to attend but we are here to worship God together, so let us sing to God's praises our opening hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. of Psalm 20, 125, we hear our call to worship today. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, 
so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. It is in the name of this Lord, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, that I greet you this morning with these words. Peace be with you. Amen. We're going to pray together now and as we're going to listen to this prayer, at the end of this prayer we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together and the words will appear on the screen. So let us now join our hearts and our minds together as one. God, you are a God of wonder and of glory. We look at the world you created and we marvel at the work of your hands. Loving God, we are gathered here as people to worship you. Some of us are here in this building, some of us are watching from our homes, but no matter where we are, we worship you today. We also come to you from different places in our faith lives. Some of us are happy and joyful to be with you and worshipping you. Some of us are weary because of the pain and injustice we suffer in this world. Some of us are searching and questioning if you are truly there. No matter where we are in our lives, dear God, no matter what we may be thinking or feeling in this moment, may you come to us and make yourself known to us so that we may glorify your name, that you looked at this creation and thought to create each and every one of us. May we praise you that you hold this world together with all of us in it. God of grace and mercy, the love you have shown us in Jesus is more than we deserve. Your arms are open wide, like a waiting father for his children, ready to welcome and restore us. God of justice and righteousness, to you we look for the truth. You are the ultimate judge. Your wisdom cuts through the lies of this world, and in your, re your word, we read that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor power nor height nor depth, or anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love that you have for us in your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, for this reason we can come to you with all our hopes, all our dreams, but also with all our failures, our hurt, rejection and pain. Lord Jesus, we are too quick to judge, to criticize and to blame others. We fail to offer others the same grace we receive from you. We hold ourselves up as superior and fail to address the patterns of dominance that we perpetuate. Forgive us, we pray your grace and your mercy. Help us to seek understanding and compassion. Help us to accept the love that you offer us and share your love with others. We come to you now thirsting for your living water. Guide us to the streams of your wonder and glory, your justice and righteousness, your grace and your mercy, that we may drink and be satisfied renewed for our continuing journey with you, Jesus. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you will guide us in wisdom and in truth, that we will follow you in our thoughts, our hearts, our actions and our words. Open our eyes to see the work that you are doing in this world and create in us the desire and the confidence to follow you. All this we pray. In your name, Holy God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And together we say the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, good morning to all of you who are young of age watching this, maybe perhaps from home, and all of us in this building who are young of heart and mind. This morning, I'm simply going to tell the story that we are going to read uh, in the service this morning. And it's a story about two men who travel on a road to a little town called Emmaus. And they are very downhearted because the person that they thought would be their saviour, Jesus Christ, was crucified and died. And they thought they would never see him again. But on the road, something magical happened. Something wonderful, something beyond what we as humans sometimes can perceive. They met Jesus, and as they met him, they didn't recognize him. But as they started walking with him along the road, they started talking to him. And as he spoke to them, they wanted to know more and know more. So as he sort of reached the town where they were going to, he made as if he wanted to walk further. But they invited them into their house and as he sat at the table with them, as they ate together, as he broke the bread, their eyes were open and they could see that he was Jesus. So this is the story that we are going to speak about today and what we are going to be thinking about is where do we see God? Where do we see Jesus in our lives? Where do we see him in everything that we do when we speak to people? when we travel with people, when we invite people into our homes, when we listen to a sermon, when we pray, where do we see Jesus? So that's the question that we're going to be thinking about today as we listen to the sermon. But before we're going to do that, we are going to sing our next hymn. The hymn is called, In Christ There Is No East or West.
waiting for us. I wonder how many of us have had an experience like this story that I'm going to quickly tell you. One day a minister had to do pastoral cover for a colleague in presbytery whilst that minister was away on holiday. And during this time there was a man in hospital in critical care and who this minister had to go and visit. The gentleman was severely ill and the doctors basically told him that he would not leave the ICU again. During the following weeks the minister visited this man and he got to know him quite well. But after the pastoral cover period ended, he assumed that he would never see him again. A year passed and at the next year's General Assembly, this minister noticed the name of a gentleman on the list of delegates, but he thought nothing of it as it was a fairly common name. However, as he stood in the queue one of the mornings to get some coffee, a gentleman tapped him on the shoulder and he looked around surprised, not realizing who it was. And the second man said, Minister, don't you know me? As he spoke, the penny dropped and they had a lovely coffee together catching up. Perhaps a real life Emmaus moment. I'm sure of us, some of us can empathize, perhaps also not recognizing those around us plain sight sometimes. And so it happened to this man called Cleopas and his fellow traveler on the gravel road between Jerusalem and Emmaus. At the beginning of our text we find these two people discouraged and exhausted and utterly disappointed. They spent the past days in Jerusalem and now they were on their way home to Emmaus trying to get away as quickly as possible. The past days were supposed to be joyous, filled with the feast of the Passover in Jerusalem. But they had great expectations of this Jesus, for they were part of the people who hoped that this Jesus of Nazareth was truly the Messiah, that he was the promised king who would ride into Jerusalem on the back of a magnificent white horse that he would chase the Romans out and that he would save Jerusalem and the people from their miserable fate. But as we know, this is not what happened at all. For things started out all wrong as Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey instead of a horse. And things ended badly when Jesus was crucified and buried in a grave man they had placed all their hope in was murdered before their eyes and a criminal was released in his place. They probably thought, yeah that's right, that's how life is. Justice is an ideal that is never achieved and the world is filled with people who make promises they never keep. I think some of us can sympathize with that as well. To emphasize their discouragement and to show that all their hope was lost. The text tells us that it was already the third day after the crucifixion as they were walking on this road to Emmaus. And it was also nearly nightfall, which meant it was almost the beginning of the fourth day. And this was very important for them as Jewish people. For the Jewish people believed that the soul leaves the body of a dead person on the fourth day after death. In other words, the time was fast running out for a miracle. Jesus would soon be something of the past. I wonder if we can sometimes associate with these men's state of mind. You also sometimes feel like your personal life or your work or all the negative things that are happening in the world around us and everything we hear of in church or everything that we hear of in the newspapers are just one too much for us. We might feel like we're struggling a little bit to balance life between our husbands or wives and kids and grandkids and family claiming all our times and the dogs 
not to even mention the work that we need to do. Someone said to me the other day, they've never been as busy as they have been in these past 18 months of the supposed lockdown. For we chase our tails from one day to the next. And then we hear a sermon on a Sunday morning that tells us that everything is going to be okay. Now, I won't judge you if you then ask the obvious question, how, how is it all going to be okay? And then it is difficult for us to hear a story like this one about Jesus' resurrection, his ascension and a few miracles. For a lot of people today, it is an enormous challenge to still believe in God and in the life of Jesus. For it is becoming increasingly difficult for us to see God at work in our world, to see God and Jesus with us and part of our daily lives. A lot of times when we do look at our lives, we look ahead and we look behind and all we see is gravel roads like the two men in our story today. A road leading only to another day and another week and another year, as the teenagers would say, same old, same old. We look around us and we see a lot, but sometimes it's difficult to find God in the lot that we see. The two men walking along the road and as they were walking they started talking to a stranger, but they do not see God in that stranger. They are looking without really seeing. Now interestingly enough, uh, we don't actually really know exactly where Emmaus was. Historians and geographers try to determine, but the honest ones admit that they just don't know. Which is very interesting for the next part. We do know where Jerusalem is. It is a city where everything ended for Jesus, but it is also the city where everything started for the disciples. And if we can use Jerusalem and Emmaus as a metaphor for a moment this morning, I want to invite you to think of these two places, a place where you know exactly where God is in Jerusalem, and a place where don't exactly know where it is, where you meet God. So we can almost say as if all of us have a place like an Emmaus, a place where we go to, whether we go there physically or whether we go there in our minds, when we feel like we've lost track of God, when we are disappointed by God, when we become disheartened. Sometimes our Emmaus can be the computer screen at work that we can't seem to get away from. Or sometimes it's the lazy boy chair in front of the TV with the remote. Sometimes Emmaus is a pub and a few too many drinks. Sometimes Emmaus is a busy shopping center with a credit card. Emmaus is always a place that we run to when we want to escape and we want to get away from things. We all have our Emmauses, and we also have our Jerusalems. We all have a place where we experience God. For some of us, it's in this building when we worship together. For others, there is a favorite place in nature, walking the hills. And for some, it is a quiet time, early in the morning or late at night, when we do our Bible readings and our prayers. But we all have these two places. And sometimes we feel like we can't see or experience God even in our Jerusalems anymore. And then we make the same mistake that these two gentlemen made in this text. That we expect nothing from our Emmaus either. The travelers on the road, they could not see God in Jerusalem and they didn't recognize him on the road to Emmaus even while they were looking Jesus right in the face. To make them see, to open their eyes for God's presence with them, Jesus helps them and he takes them through a process 
to open their eyes, to see the world anew, and to see God with them. We can almost say that Jesus is doing a kind of an eye exercise with them to teach them to see God anew. And he takes the Jerusalem experience where they were happy and they experienced God to their Emmaus place where they thought they would never see God again. So in this text we read that Jesus does five things with them, a five step process if you will on this journey that he takes with them to help them to see God and it is five steps that we can experience when we are in a church service like this together or when we sit at home or when we go to our Emmaus places the first thing that Jesus does is he reminds them of community Cleopas and his companion share their doubts with a stranger on the road, someone they meet along the way. They are both in the presence of the Lord and thus they share in this community. It is like when we as Christians come together to worship on a Sunday morning in a church service with all our questions, with all our doubts, with all our sadness, as well as with all our joy and all our faith. Believers gather in worship together to see the risen Lord and this story helps us to see that Jesus Christ is with us here as we worship and when we leave and we go out these doors to our different places of Emmaus as well he's with us on every road in every place we find ourselves the theologian Michael Welker wrote about this and he said that the resurrection of Jesus was so much more than just a physical bodily resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus, he writes, means that Jesus was raised in such a way that he fills every second and every centimeter of this world that we live in. This means for us that we are as close to the risen Lord as Cleopas and his companion was on the road to Emmaus. In a gathering like a worship service like this, we experience community with one another and with the risen Lord. When we believe that, it makes it much easier for us to recognize God in our lives. Then we don't simply think of him as somewhere far off, away from us, only sitting at the right hand of the Father, but that He is with us here and now, with you and with me, with all of us, present and living. So that's the first thing that Jesus does on this road to Emmaus. He invites them into a sense of community, of being together. Step two on this journey or in this process on the road to Emmaus is that Jesus opened the scriptures to them or for them and he explained to them all that was said in the scriptures about himself. Much like we do here in a worship service while we listen to God's word, they experienced on the road to Emmaus Jesus showing himself to them as the Messiah. Step three quickly follows after then with Jesus pretending to walk on and they invite him to stay. And this sentence has become one of the most prayed sentences in monasteries across the world. The sentence that says, stay with us for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So we pray in a church service to prepare ourselves and to declare our dependence on God. As they ask Jesus to remain with them, we also ask Jesus to remain with us, to be with us. And in their hospitality, they met Jesus. By opening their home to him, they met him. Step four in this process is when Jesus takes the bread when he blesses it and 
he breaks it. And we don't have to let our imaginations travel too far to see that this is another reference to the communion like Jesus had before his crucifixion with his 12 disciples. So Jesus joined the two travelers at the table. He took bread, he blessed it, he broke it and he gave it to them exactly the same way that we celebrate the communion together and in the breaking of the bread we reach the core of this story that Luke wrote then their eyes were opened and they recognized him in other words in the communion they recognized Jesus as their Savior in eating bread at the table we find Jesus at the table we see the risen Lord after the bread is broken. They invited him in, but in reality it is Jesus who becomes the host of the table, inviting them to become a part of him. The stranger whom they did not recognize at first becomes the host and helps them to see God, to recognize him as God. Lastly, during step five, the travelers get moving. This can also be compared to a church service as this that we have. After the hymns and the prayers and the sermon and some more prayers, we are charged with action and we are blessed to be sent out into this world. In this process, the travelers see God. They discover Jesus as the Messiah. And this does something to them. They move and they go and they tell others. They asked one another, were not our hearts burning within us? And they take the road back to Jerusalem and they go and they meet others and they tell more and more people that they met Jesus on the road. In the same way, our worship does not end when we leave this building or our homes or our places of Emmaus. That is where our worship should continue and where the service of life actually starts. Then we go and we live what we have experienced here in this church building. So Luke 24 gives us a wonderful process to meet and to see God in our everyday lives where we meet others where we invite strangers into our homes where we read and when we speak about the Bible when we pray when we break bread together and then go into the world at large that is where we experience and see God in everything and in everyone challenge for us is to ask ourselves how do we do that in our homes in our places of work and in all the places that we do not expect to meet God but where he is truly present as well this morning as we are going to share communion together and as we prepare ourselves to meet Jesus in bread and wine around the table. I want to invite you to think for a moment as you reflect on what you've heard today. Think about your Jerusalem. Think about the place where you experience God, where it all feels as if God is close and you see him and you are joyful. And then also think about Maybe your place of Emmaus where it's difficult for you to experience God, whether it is at your work or at home. Think about where God is. Think about who God is. Think about where you experience Him the most and where you experience Him the least. then ask yourself this question this morning. Do you truly believe that he is with you 
everywhere that you go. As we prepare for sharing in communion together, Sybil is going to play for us the beautiful hymn, Break Now the Bread of Life. And the words are going to appear on the screen. And as we prepare and as we listen to the music, think about the words. Break now the bread of life. Thank you so much. the table of the Lord. He invites all who sit with him to share in this joyful feast. We are here because Jesus has invited us. For Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will bear much fruit, for you can do nothing without me. I love you just as the Father loves me remain in my love if you obey my commands you will remain in my love just as i have obeyed my father's commands and remain in his love i have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete my commandment is this love one another just as i love you it is not for our virtue that we are here. It is not for who we are that we are called to the stable. It is only for one reason, that God wants us. So come, come to the stable and leave behind the baggage of your self-importance and the burden of your self-loathing. How you feel, who you are and what you have done at this moment 
does not matter. There is a greater truth and there is a stronger voice and it is the voice of Jesus who in bread and wine says to each of us, I am here for you. When Jesus was on earth, he often ate with people. And on the night before he was crucified, when darkness was beginning to fall, he sat at a table like this with his disciples in an upper room in Jerusalem. At this last supper, Jesus took the bread and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in memory of me. In the same way, he took the cup after the supper and said, this cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in memory of me. He told his disciples to remember him by following his example. And today we, as his disciples, also follow his example. And we are glad to do what Jesus asked us to do. So as Jesus gave thanks, let us give our thanks and praise to God. Let us pray. Loving God, you made this world marvelous for us to enjoy. You gave Jesus Christ, your son, to be our savior and our friend. Through him, you have brought us to you. You also sent us your spirit to make us into one family in Jesus Christ. For these gifts of love, we thank you, and we join with the angels and saints in the joyful hymn of praise, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy God, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. For your kindness to us and for your goodness to all, we give you our thanks and praise. We thank you that you showed your love for us by sending your Son, who gave his life for us and rose again from death and lives and prays for us at your right hand. We thank you that he has taken away all that separates us from you so that we can draw near to you, that we can love you and so that we can love one another. We thank you that he has brought us together at this table to strengthen us by his love. We pray, Lord, send your Holy Spirit on us and these gifts of bread and wine, that we may know Christ's presence real and true and be his faithful followers, showing your love for the world. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, and in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour are yours, almighty God, now and forevermore. Amen. So the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks to God, he broke it and said, This is my body which is broken for you. Do this and remember me. In the same way, he took the cup after the meal and said, This cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood. Drink from it and remember me. Now taste and see that the Lord is good.
as we cannot share the peace with one another, receive now the peace of God in your heart. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, through the powerful work of the Holy Spirit within you. Amen. Let us join our hearts and our minds together as one. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come to you with hearts that need to be open to your word and your love. There is so much around us that tear at us and causes us to tremble. Keep us ever mindful of your presence and the hope that you have given us in your Son, Jesus Christ, as we celebrated at this table this morning. Guide us, we pray, as your church, struggling to spread the good news. Keep us focused on the mission and the ministry to which you have called us and lead us forward. We know, Lord, that there will often be bumps along the way, but save us from dwelling on them and make us secure in the goals that you have placed before us. Help us to trust that you walk the road with us, whether we walk from our Jerusalems or our Emmauses or wherever our journey takes us. Hear now, dear Lord, also our prayers for all who need your tender touch of healing in their lives. Those we name before you each day and those are known only to you in the depths of our hearts. We pray, be with those who mourn. May we all remember the love and grace that your faithful people have brought to our world. We pray for all your creation, always at odds with one another. We pray that you would guide our leaders and those of other nations that this world might truly be as you created it to be, a place of peace, hope and love. And inspired by your generosity towards us, we also return our gifts to you, dear God. May our offering today spread the hope of Jesus Christ to those most in need. These are our prayers, together with those that lie on the hearts of all your faithful people, which we offer to you in the spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ, who said, Not my will, but thine be done. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is You Are Called to Tell the Story, a tune which is well known. The words might not be as well known to you, but let's give it a go.
to meet God in every day and in every place, in every person and in every space. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you and all whom you love this day and forevermore. Amen.